Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here for another edition of the show. All right, um, still in the Moment app and I just remembered um, the last time I used the Moment app, which was uh, for my anniversary episode, um, there was some weird stuff with the audio. So I'm using this and so which, if you've been to the YouTube channel, um, instead of like watching this on iPod, you know, uh, your app, you know, the podcast app or going to the website, um, you may have noticed that uh, I've created some playlists already and one of the playlists says behind the scenes and those have been like the so you want to be a podcaster episodes that I've done in the past. Well, I plan on doing actually more of that style um, but they won't be true episodes. They won't actually be part of the podcast. They won't be on the website. They'll be only on YouTube and I, I may have mentioned this on video. I can't remember. I know I've put it on Instagram and others but so I plan to do things like that where um, I kind of talk about how I produce the podcast or equipment that I have uh, to not necessarily Corvin, um, but like, you know, these, these audio recorders and all that. But what I've noticed is that this audio recorder is almost always perfectly in sync, pretty much no matter how, what video camera I'm using. The Vixie has always been in sync with this. Um, the phone kind of depends, but, uh, I don't remember if I used this or I used my bigger, um, no, I did use this one for my anniversary show for me. And then I had my, my other one, my larger one trying to take ambient sound, but it didn't really work out so well. So I didn't even use that audio, but, uh, um, uh, anyway, but I noticed that, you know, it wasn't synced. So that's got a future episode about syncing and how to prevent that and how to fix it. Um, but more how to prevent it. And, and all that. So once I figure out how to do that. All right, so let's get into this next wine. All right, so this is um, the 2011, again, another wine with a decent amount of age on it. Um, it just, hey, I randomly picked a lot of old stuff. Actually, I don't have anything newer than 2014. 2014 is the most recent wine that I'm going to be reviewing in this group of wines. It's not the Halloween episode because that's a 17. I think it's a 17. Yeah, the wine I'm doing is a 17. Anyway, um, so this is the Cusinho, because there's a little tilde over the end, uh, Macul, 2011 Chardonnay from the Antiguas Reservas. Uh, 12 bucks I paid for it on Underground Cellar, valued at $18. So, um, who are these guys? They were founded in 1856 uh, in Chile. Um, they were, it was the only vineyard in Chile established in the... 18th century? Yeah, 18th century. They're using Roman numerals, and, and while I did take Latin, and you know I was definitely well-versed in Roman numerals way back then, I sometimes have to think about it now. Um, that still remains in the original family. So it's not that they had the, old, the oldest vineyards, but they're still with the original family. Um, is there any... I didn't... I didn't... I didn't... Oh, there we go. Luckily, you have more. All right. Yeah, like the Moment app is like kind of like jittery, so I'm hoping it's recording right. If not, hey, I've got the backup with the Vixia. Um, anyway, let's put that off to the side. Uh, ba, 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 ba. So with the incorporation of new lines of wine like Finisterre and Dama de Plata, the acquisition of terrain in Pain and other important milestones, the new generations have maintained the family tradition while also leaving their own legacy on the vineyard. Currently, the sixth and seventh generation of the family are managing and shaping the trajectory of the business. Um, let's see here. And then uh, let's get to, there we go. I wanna go to the history page real quick. That was like just the quick overview and I thought there was something with history that I wanted to cover, but 
Here we go. It was like it wasn't it wasn't loading. Um, let's see here. So they're rooted on land that since the 15th century, though they put five instead of they put like they put six. 16th century, they put a six. They they forgot the they forgot the X. Um, I, I know it hasn't been since the seventh since the sixth century. There uh, has been used for wine production. Juan Ufre uh, or Hufre um, was the first man to plant vines on the train before uh, Matias Cusino acquired the original 1,000 hectares some 500 years ago. Um, let's see here. So during that time, the vineyard provided wine to the uh, churches and parts of Chilean society. So 300 years later, in 1856, uh, Mat Mat Matthias or Matthias uh, Cusino uh, acquired a thousand hectares of the land and uh, said stretched from the current set vineyard that stretched from the current vineyard to the center of Santiago. Now, at some point, they actually moved to, I think it was, they said Payne, um, so for, to kind of expand, because Santiago started expanding, so they moved out more to the country. And let's see here, um, uh, blah, 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 who is it? Uh, Isadora, so she was, I believe, Mattias' wife. Now, after Mattias' death, his son, Luis, uh, inherited the land, and, uh, Inherit the land, and then he put much effort into improving things. And then, um, yeah, then he married, uh, then he married, um, Isadora, and then she kind of like took the company to like a new level. Uh, so she was a badass. And then, um, let's see, first year of production in Payne was 2001, so in 1996. They acquired 300 hectares in the city of Payne to transition the vineyard out of Santiago. Um, and then uh, 2006, it said they turned 150 years old and they launched the Lota. They launched Lota, a line of wine that represents the best of the Maipo Valley. All right, so what about this wine? So uh, this is from the Maipo Valley, a uh, small, small percentage fermented in new French oak barrels. Um, there's a little bit of sugar, 1.29 grams per liter. I'm actually impressed that they put it there, but the pH is 3.25, but it says total acidity is 4.87 grams per liter. So you remember that other one was a 3.39, but total acidity is 6.5. So this, it's no, so it's not like an exact correlation. So this is a much lower pH, like a lot lower, but that total acidity, assuming that the other wine was a total acidity of 6.5, isn't as high. But you would think it would be like eight based upon the pH being 3.25. Um, let's see here. So the first uh, version of this wine was made in 1969. And then uh, so since then, the trademark applies to the appointment of a selection of Chardonnay that represents the finest vintage. The selection process begins in the vineyard with the restrictions of yield per plant and continues throughout the entire winemaking process. Let's see here. Um... It says the climate during this season, no, wait a minute, this is 13, right? This is 11. I don't have notes for 11, so yeah. So forget the, forget those acidity numbers and pH numbers. That's for the, that's for the, um, I think for the 16. Yeah, for the 16, um, not for the 11. Anyway, so uh, let's see here, a vinification so after a, after a careful hand picking that began the first days of March, the grapes were brought to the winery, passed through a bunch, a, through a bunch selection, and subsequently pressed. A small percentage of the juice is fermented in new French oak barrels and matures for about six months. All the remaining mixture is fermented in stainless steel in order to enhance and respect the fruit flavors of the strain that they use. Before being bottled, they um, mix the two, and then the wine is clarified and filtered. Um, let's see, that's it as far as notes that are generic enough. It's a little unusual. It's like a, I hate to say it, almost like a rotten apple. Like really like, like the apple's been sitting out for a little bit. Yeah, 
Yeah, actually, it, it you know what it actually smells like? And I'm hoping that maybe it's just, it's just kind of, I think it smells like spoiled milk. I don't know. Like cottage cheese, spoiled milk. It, it's, it don't smell that good. So I don't know if this is a bad bottle or it's just too old. Maybe it's not meant to last eight years. Let's check it. Maybe it tastes really great because, hey, man, you know, French wines are known to smell like poopy and then they taste awesome. Yeah, it's like, <clears throat> it's like, you know, cottage cheese and apples. Though most people, a lot of people like that. I don't, but a lot of people like that. So let's check it out. Yeah, it kind of comes through on the palate too. Um, a little orange, uh, kind of oaky, uh, for sure, kind of oaky. Um, the acid's pretty high though. I mean, it for an eight-year-old wine, Chardonnay, it's still pretty high. So, it, you know, um, it's got the apple, it's got that cottage cheese thing, it's got orange, it's got like a marmalade to it. Um, it's got like the oak characteristics, like a little vanilla, um, a little toastiness. You know what it could be? It could be this wine just literally needs to be decanted. I, I'll just, I'll just fly. I don't, I don't like this wine. I don't know, like I said, it might be a bad bottle. On the surface, it seems like the, the wine's okay, like it's sound, but I just don't like how it tastes, I don't like how it smells. And um, to kind of harken back to a couple episodes ago where I talked about like, you know, I didn't really understand why people get all excited about Chardonnay and Pinot Noir and Riesling, and I visited, you know, Burgundy and, and Germany, basically the birthplaces of those grapes, and I was like, I get it. This is one of those Chardonnays. I'm like, why are people so excited about Chardonnay? I mean, even like the last, even like the last episode, it's not a bad Chardonnay. It's just not the style of Chardonnay I like, which is fine, because that's what's awesome about wine. You can, there's like a wine for everybody. This thing could be like stupidly sweet, and I'd be like, I don't like it. But if you like, not I don't want to say stupidly, but you like, if you like some really sweet, you know, Chardonnay or sweet wine, totally go for it, and that's that's okay. Um, yeah, I'm just, just not a fan of the wine. So I don't know. I, I may uh, may someday like just decant it and let it air out, and we'll see how it is. The good thing is that um, I only paid 12 bucks for it, so I, I'm not really out a lot of money on it. It's valued at 18, so it's not a, it's not a super expensive wine, but um, it also could be just my view past its prime. It shouldn't be. Tasting the acid on it should have preserved it pretty well, um, but it also may not, it may have been more intended to be drank by like 2015 or 16 or something like that instead of 2019. All right, so that's going to do it for this episode. That's kind of a bummer. Uh, so click the links above to friend me up. Click the links below to find out more about the winery. Um, I'm hoping to try other wines from them and I have a better, like, better experience. I'm sure they make good wine. Um, you can uh, click the link over there. Uh, see, this episode, I should be in Oregon. So if you want it while I'm there, you want to send me some ducats, that'll help out. And uh, we'll see everyone again next time.